As with other North American cities, the history of Toronto's construction industry is riddled with sinister figures, unlawful activities, and outbursts of violence. The presence of organized crime is a key part of the history of this highly complex industry, which in the 1960s and 70s attracted a great deal of attention from police investigators, journalists, and government officials. Their revelations aroused public anxiety in this once sleepy city, along with its fascination and eagerness to learn more about its newfound criminal underworld and its sinister meetings in the fringes of the growing metropolis. And learn they did, together with Judge Harry Weisberg, who led a Royal Commission inquiry into the infiltration by organized crime and the resurgence of violence in some fields of the construction industry between 1968 and 1972. Another public expose came in 1980 in the form of a non-fiction book titled Sweethearts, written by journalist Catherine Wismer after she interviewed one of the leading men in this real-life opera. I met Zanini, I would say, 71, 72. I was living in Cabbage Town, and uh, I was a, a journalist at that point in time, working for some national magazines. And as a journalist, you're always looking for a story. And one of my neighbors was a lawyer who had uh, numerous Italian um, clients who, immigrants that came over in the 50s, and they now had their own companies. And this would be around 1970. And um, he was telling me what he had learned from his uh, clients about some of the appalling conditions there were in, in the early, late 1950s and 60s. When they first came over, they wanted to come over and work here, send money back to their family, and then eventually go back to Italy. He also mentioned that there was uh, a fellow called Bruno Zanini who really wanted to tell his story. It had, hadn't been told, and he was wondering if I would be interested to listen to him. So I said, of course, I would be glad to listen to him. Well, Zanini was a very colorful character, and he always had an opera, uh, La Boheme, Traviata sheet in his briefcase. At that point in time, I had a cigarette. I used to smoke a little, and he said, oh, I can't, I can't come close to you, you're smoking. And uh, I said, well, you, you mind? And he said, yes, I do mind, because I, am, I consider myself an opera singer, and I want to protect my vocal cords. So I said, all right, Bruno, I will agree. And uh, we sat down, and he had, um, scrapbook after scrapbook of newspaper clippings. Well, Zanini wanted the story out. He felt that it hadn't been done properly. There have been two or three inquiries into the construction industry, and the last one was Judge Weisberg. And even when that report came out, he felt it hadn't told the whole story. Zanini wanted an inquiry into the financing of the construction industry and the exploitation of the workers. Because a lot of the violence that happened in those five years, it, it had earlier disruptions from what the industry was like in 61, 62, 63. After the Second World War, Metro Toronto's fast economic and population growth turned residential development into a very profitable yet risky business venture. Hundreds of thousands of acres of farmland surrounding Toronto were bought by land developers and speculators in a real estate rush that inflated land prices beyond the means of traditional residential builders, or whatever was left of them, after the Great Depression and the war reduced their numbers along with building materials, skilled labor, and the availability of affordable credit. Fearing a post-war recession, Canadian banks tightened their money on the face of big borrowers for whom loans were too costly or simply unavailable. But the promise of quick and easy profits in Metro Toronto's real estate screamed in the minds of aspiring capitalists with enough cash to throw into this booming market. Dentists, grocers, accountants, and all matter of entrepreneurs wagered their savings, believing the bigger folly was to miss the opportunity. To the amazement of urban planners, some of these speculators became builders themselves, when they decided to develop their own tracts of land. 
But unlike traditional builders, who had typically built a dozen houses per year, this new breed of large-scale developers knew nothing about construction. So they hired contractors and subcontractors to take care of their subdivision projects and recruit the necessary workforce. With greed as their driving motivation, these new builders were all too keen to hire inadequate subcontractors as long as they made the lowest bid on their projects. To ensure that their prices remain low, housing developers helped create hundreds of small and poorly financed subcontracting firms, most of them operated by recently arrived immigrants, some with little experience in the construction trades. Besides running unsealed tenders and playing contractors against each other, these new builders also employed kickback schemes, where they paid these small companies under the table whenever they made impossibly low bids. Honest subcontractors had no chance of competing in this ruthless system. Along with the brutal labor exploitation that led to the creation of the Brandon Union Group in the early 60s, this profit-obsessed industry also produced a very large amount of substandard housing in Toronto's inner suburbs, riddled with plumbing, electrical and heating problems, poor layouts, and cheap hazardous materials like asbestos. Still, these inexpensive and uninspiring strawberry boxes as one respected architect described them, could not have been sold any faster to the growing number of middle-class families buying into the suburban utopia, where everyone would be able to have a house and a car of their own, assisted by readily available and inexpensive mortgages introduced by the 1954 National Housing Act. Together with the sprawling suburbs came the car-centric strip malls and shopping plazas catering to the consumer needs of commuters increasingly removed from the downtown commercial areas. Their popularity prompted the construction of giant malls located near major highways, which took up several dozens of acres for large big box stores and smaller retailers, standing like islands amidst an even larger sea of paved parking lots. There was a great deal of money to be made in these ventures for builder landlords if they could find the seed money and stomach the risk. In order to get their projects off the ground, shopping mall and high-rise apartment builders needed cash up front to secure financing from lending institutions. Once their projects were completed and all retail stores or apartment units were leased, developers made a good return on their investment. But the degree of unpredictability was high, with fluctuating credit markets, labor unrest, and other delays causing many sleepless nights. Some builders thrived in this cash-poor environment, like principal investments, the largest land developer in Canada between 1949 and 1963. Principal's niche was building and leasing shopping centers, including 14 locations in Toronto. According to Wismer, on at least one documented occasion involving its Dufferin Mall project, Principal borrowed money from a Toronto-based associate of the well-known American mobster Meyer Lansky, also known as the Mob's Accountant. Meyer Lansky, he was a Jewish fellow and he was very friendly with Lucky Luciano. And back in the 20s, they were along with, uh, they got involved with bootleg liquor, along with, I believe, the Bronfmans in Montreal. So this was uh, how Lansky started. Once Prohibition ended, Lansky moved into other ventures, and it, he ended up it, with casinos and he had two or three, four casinos, and that was his business, really. After every nightly take, he'd skim off a certain percentage. It was all tax-free, and he would have his courier, and in this case it was John Pullman, uh, courier the, the skim, the funds, to a Swiss bank, and from the Swiss bank, Pullman would come back and reinvest the tax-free money into real estate, mining, various ventures in North America and, in this case, in Toronto. And Pullman uh, actually became uh, a partner with Principal Investments in 1950. And Principal Investments was a very small company until the late 40s, and then it grew rapidly, very rapidly, to become one of the biggest shopping center uh, developers. What happened was very legitimate in a sense because once you had the shopping mall and you were the landlord, you would 
be, you would have a percentage, you would take a percentage of a leasing company of their profits. But it was all legal. But this was, this was the, really the first time that, the, that we had the term washing money or money laundering, taking profits from business, illegitimate business, to all tax free back into legitimate businesses in North America. And it was a constant uh, supply of cash. I do have that in the book, uh, the Pullman Principal uh, Partnership, but all those files have been destroyed uh, because of a change in the Corporation Information Act in 1976 that got rid of corporate files on the grounds of a economy, taking up space. And also there was a mysterious fire where 4,100 corporate files went up in flames. And that was also in the early 70s. So there's really no way to go back and, except for the fact that I still have that evidence. One of the most common tactics used by American mobsters was to infiltrate and eventually control vulnerable unions, which were made to serve the interests of crime syndicates as instruments of coercion and extortion of uncooperative businesses. Employers that refused to pay these mob-controlled unions could find themselves without workers, their job sites picketed, their projects sabotaged, or their offices burnt down by mysterious fires. Besides being used as pawns, Workers also had their dues skimmed, their wages lowered in return for kickbacks from employers, and their pension funds used to finance mob-friendly businesses through interest-free loans. In turn, law-abiding companies found it nearly impossible to compete with their law-breaking rivals and folded. This underworld of union racketeering was exposed by a Senate inquiry known as the McClellan Committee, which carried extensive investigations between 1957 and 1960 including testimonials from more than 1,500 witnesses questioned by then Chief Counsel Robert Kennedy, many of them on national TV. The investigation focused primarily on the operations of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters and its notorious leader Jimmy Hoffa's association with crime syndicates in Portland, Oregon, although it did conclude that the corrupting influence of mob-controlled unions also extended to other major cities in the U.S. This type of labor racketeering crossed the border into Canada. After the 1961 construction strike, rumors emerged that developers had been the target of extortion by criminal syndicates, who promised to stop the labor dispute if they were paid a hefty sum of money. Allegedly, some builders did pay, but were later upset when they found that they had been swindled since the strike continued. At this point, Zanini claimed to have received threatening phone calls, having his tires slashed and being shot at while driving, the bullet grazing the top of his car. According to him, those defrauded builders were behind these attacks, since they were convinced that he and his partner Charles Irvine had pocketed their supposed payoff. Around the same time that this was happening, in September and October 1961, three apartment building projects in North York were destroyed by dynamite. In one case, an innocent bystander was injured while driving near the site of an explosion. The police investigation that followed was unable to identify any suspects or motives. That same year, Irvine, who was the Vice President for Canada of the Plasterers International Union, instructed Edward Thompson, the business manager of its commercial Local 48, to create and enforce an illegal price-fixing combine with a group of plastering contractors. Tired of the developers' bid peddling, these contractors coordinated efforts in order to resist the industry's self-defeating cutthroat competition that only benefited the builders. The companies involved in this scheme were randomly assigned jobs where the chosen contractor was allowed to estimate its price at cost plus a 30% profit margin, while its bogus competitors placed phony bids above that of the combine's pick. The contractors also paid sizable kickers into a fund that was meant to cover the wages of local 48 workers whenever they were told to walk out of jobs run by contractors who disobeyed the rules. Under this scheme, Local 48 would not enter into a collective agreement with a contractor that was not a member of the Combine, which in turn would find it very difficult to recruit workers or carry on with its building projects without being harassed. 
Up to $4 million worth of commercial plastering contracts may have been processed through this ring every year between 1964 and 1967. As a witness in the Royal Commission inquiry, Thompson referred to Irvine as the Great White Father, who had more power than God over the plasterers' locals, and to his own enforcer role in the Combine as the Gestapo. The Local 48's former business manager described one episode where Irvine ordered him to drive an elderly contractor into the countryside where two other rival contractors threatened to beat him up for having underbid them. Meanwhile, the residential locals that made up the Brandon Union Group hired new business agents to enforce collective agreements and organize individual companies. These rookie agents were trained by a team of American labor experts sent by the international unions in the U.S. But in short time, these American envoys took control of these locals and deployed very aggressive tactics commonly used in the U.S., including rotating illegal walkouts on specific subcontractors, which pushed many of them out of business. It became apparent that an extortion racket had been set up within the Brandon Union Group. Presumably moved by these developments, the Laborers International instructed Zanini to break away from that alliance. Shortly after this split, Zanini claimed to have been approached by Paul Volpe, a man with an imposing physique and a criminal record for conspiracy and fraud, who introduced himself as a labor consultant. Volpe was known to Toronto police as a loan shark who ran illegal gambling sessions in the city, and who had once operated a casino with mafia ties in Haiti. According to the RCMP, he was one of five Toronto-based brothers associated with Buffalo's Cosa Nostra, then run by Joseph Fino. Among other criminal ventures, the Buffalo Mafia controlled the laborers' local 210, which it used for racketeering and giving well-paid patronage positions to its mobsters. An FBI investigation later revealed that Fino visited Toronto regularly on mob business, during which he dropped off his family at the CNE before meeting up with Volpe, sometimes on a boat in Lake Ontario. According to Fino's son, who became an FBI informant, his Mafia family used funds from Canadian unions to finance its scams, including injecting union benefits funds into mob-controlled businesses, manipulating stock prices and taking kickbacks from stockbrokers, mixing hazardous wastes with fuel and reselling them in Canada, and selling asbestos-contaminated metals to scrapyards in Hamilton. Paul Volpe uh, ran a car wash. He got into some real estate, and then he and his brother got involved with running a casino and I think there was a Senate investigating committee in 1963 that linked Al Volpe, his brother, with the uh, Buffalo mob. Zanini said he, at that point in time he got a call from Volpe, who had connections with the Magadino family in Buffalo. And Volpe said, you know, why are you screwing the men out? Why, why did you leave the Brandon Union Group in, in 61? He said, I, Zanini says, I got promoted. And they wanted me to take that union out. After this initial phone call, Zanini asked a mutual acquaintance from his gambling days to vouch for him as a man of integrity who had served his prison sentences honorably without ever snitching. According to Zanini, Volpe amicably assured him that his associates meant no harm. Still, the labor organizer was convinced that there was a price on his head and that competing mob groups were trying to infiltrate the residential union locals that he helped create. He later told Wismer that an unnamed business agent had tried to put a hit on him, but nothing came of it because the would-be shooter was a personal friend of Zanini. And that's when he decided to get a bodyguard and he hired two fellows who he drove around with them and he, he said, uh, he, he said, if you hang around with this type long enough, you start doing things that they're doing. And what happened is they, they had asked him to drive him one night because they wanted to steal something from somebody's house. And it was a bit of a sting. They got caught and Zanini was still, he was just the driver but they found in the car a screwdriver and a flashlight, and that was enough to put Zanini uh, in jail for five years. When he got out in 68, Gus Simone of the Lathers Union 
said, Bruno, why don't you uh, come and help me organize these workers? Because there's this new trade, drywall, and there's also concrete forming. So Zanini said, great. And Simone, according to Zanini, said, he said, I'll buy you a Cadillac. Zanini said, oh no, I, no, I don't need a Cadillac. I'll just show you how I can get these workers into the union. And he went, and Zanini went to work. At that point in the residential, there was one man who dominated, and his name was Nick DiLorenzo. He got the jobs from the apartment builders because he always put in the lowest bid. They would say, well, can you do it lower than that? Can you do it lower than that? And DiLorenzo always said, yes, yes, yes. And so he was getting the work, and he had 60% of the men working for him. And he, of course, didn't want unions. And in fact, he ended up hiring a private investigator just to make sure none of his men are joining unions. In the fall of 1968, with Zanini by his side, Simone was able to convince Di Lorenzo to sign a five-year collective agreement with his Lathers Local 562, which his rivals in the Council of Forming Trade Unions considered to be a sweetheart deal given the very favorable terms it gave to employers. Two of Di Lorenzo's main competitors, Leader Structures, owned by his fellow Italian Aurelio Bianchini, and Fran Kiri Forming, owned by the Greek immigrant Kiriakos Vlahos, refused to sign this deal with Simone's union local, whose members Di Lorenzo had helped organize. Soon after this, Bianchini's and Vlahos's company offices and building projects in Metro Toronto and Ottawa were the target of nine separate attacks. In some cases, Workers' lives were endangered. Responding to this union war, as the press called it, the Metro Toronto and Ontario Provincial Police, together with the RCMP, launched an investigation called Project B. Their prime suspects included Di Lorenzo, Simone, and Zanini, whose sites and workers were not attacked. In 68, when these three companies refused to sign with Gus Simone and the Lathers, leader structures, their main office was hit by fire. I think it was $75,000 it burnt down. There were four more fires that Leader experienced. In some of the projects that they had, the jacks were lowered on a concrete floor. And there were more instances. Aurelio Bianchini called up Zanini and said, what is happening? Are you burning? Who's doing this? Somebody's putting me out of business with all this. Speaking at a church event on March 5th, 1969, Toronto's Chief of Police James Mackey stated publicly that an extortion racket was behind the recent attacks and referred to the leaders of the Lathers Local 562 as criminals. He presented no evidence to corroborate these claims, which provoked backlash from the Building Trades Council which called on Mackey to either lay charges or resign for having smeared the whole labor movement. One of the labor leaders to demand an explanation from the chief of police was Jerry Gallagher of the Laborers Local 183, who was granted a meeting with Mackey after his men picketed the police headquarters. Gallagher emerged from that conversation satisfied upon confirming that his union local was not the target of the accusations. As for Di Lorenzo and Simone, Suspicion surrounding their involvement in the recent violence in the industry was heightened after they received death threats connecting them with the attacks on leaders and Fran Kiri. In addition to the threatening note left on his garage door, two of Di Lorenzo's office workers also received threats telling them to quit their jobs or be killed. Three months later, the Toronto police arrested Di Lorenzo's former union buster, Norman Menezes, and two of his associates on charges of extortion. It turned out Menezes was behind the threatening notes. The private detective confessed that he had arranged for Di Lorenzo's note in the hope that he would scare the contractor into rehiring him for protection. According to Menezes, the threatening note to Simone had been arranged by Di Lorenzo himself with the intent of shifting the attention away from him. Menezes made a plea bargain with the police and his charges were dropped in exchange for incriminating information on his former employer, which led to Di Lorenzo's arrest on October 3rd, 1969. In 1969, the investigator actually threatened DiLorenzo. 
And uh, the police said, well, do you, want to, do you have anything else to say? We could drop charges on you. And the investigator said, yeah, I'll tell you what my boss wanted me to do. He wanted me to uh, hit jobs of his competitors, arson, fire, whatever. He wanted me to assault a journalist. Uh, and with that information, the police arrested DiLorenzo. I think there were 11 charges. Uh, seven, I believe, were withdrawn. And four, after a lengthy trial, he, he was acquitted. The charges against the forming contractor heard at the Supreme Court of Ontario in 1971 included threatening a former employee turned business rival in Ottawa, conspiracy to assault the leader structures manager, James Daw, conspiracy to assault the laborers' local 506 union organizer and radio broadcaster, Marino Topan, and an attempt to extort money from Kiriakos Vlahos, president of Fran Kiri Forming. In the latter case, multiple witnesses testified that Menezes and his associates had taken explicit photos of Lajos in bed with a sex worker who was intimate with Di Lorenzo with the intent of blackmailing his business rival. However, there was no solid evidence that Menezes had acted on Di Lorenzo's instructions. The jury was also torn on whether or not Menezes' testimony was to be believed. In the end, the forming contractor was acquitted of all charges brought against him. But soon after the trial, Di Lorenzo's companies went into receivership for which he blamed both the unions with their incessant strikes and the developers for playing contractors against each other. The boy wonder of the building industry, as one newspaper described him, had built and lost an empire before the age of 35. Meanwhile, Gus Simone and his Lathers Local 562 continued to expand in the drywall field. They took advantage of an owner-builder clause in the agreement signed between the Building Trades Council and the apartment builders in September 1969. Under this clause, developers building on land that they owned were allowed to employ cheaper residential workers in commercial construction projects. Simone was willing to offer employers his lower paid residential workers to the detriment of the members of the Lathers Commercial Local 97, who were paid up to 70 cents more per hour. After a failed merger between the two locals in 1970, Local 97's membership dwindled until it joined the Carpenters Union in 1973, leaving Simone's Local 562 as the sole provider of drywall installation workers in all of Metro Toronto. The traditional wooden lath and wet plaster method of finishing interior walls is on the way out. The new method is a system of screwing plasterboard panels to metal laths. It's called drywall. And drywall has brought a dispute between the lathers union and the carpenters union for jurisdiction over the work. A criminal consortium could squeeze enormous illicit profits out of drywall construction but only if the same group controlled both the bulk of drywall contracts and the union doing the work. Since the mid-1960s, Simone had used his labor broker monopoly to help run an illegal bidding ring with a group of laughing subcontractors in the residential sector. Similar to Irvine's arrangement with the plastering contractors, each participating company paid Simone to regulate the combine and ensure that everyone played by the rules at the risk of finding themselves without workers or worse. In one case, the laughing subcontractor Giuseppe D'Alessandro had one of his job sites vandalized, which he believed was a targeted attack. After this incident, he met with Simone, the Lathers business agent Frank Fiore, and another subcontractor, during which it was suggested to D'Alessandro that if he gave a couple of freezers to the two union officials, his problems would go away. So. He did as instructed. Two years later, in 1968, D'Alessandro received further instructions to go to the Conroy Hotel and give $1,000 to Simone as a token of appreciation for Local 562's recently signed sweetheart deal with the laughing subcontractors. According to D'Alessandro, about 10 other companies did the same. To ensure that they were given preferential treatment when it came to receiving the best workers, some firms offered additional gifts to Simone, including company shares, home renovations, a trip to Italy, or simply cash. The bidding schemes worked relatively well until 1969, when 11 lathing and plastering contractors pleaded guilty to price-fixing charges at the Supreme Court of Ontario. That year, Irvine expelled the president of the Plasterers Local 117 after he filed a complaint with the Ontario Labour Relations Board, accusing Irvine of accepting bribes from some contractors who were given a free hand to exploit their workers. 
The locals' membership, which had long been upset with Irvine's authoritarian ways and lack of financial reporting, became even more upset after this expulsion. In May 1971, a group of disgruntled members put forward a slate of candidates for the union's executive elections, but their nominations were declared invalid by Irvine, who subsequently fired Local 117's executive and became its sole trustee. Most of the membership left in protest and joined a rival union. Two years later, Local 117, one of the first unions in Toronto's residential construction sector and a founding member of the Brandon Union Group, was left with only 12 members. Irvine and his business agent, Angelo Burigana, allegedly hid this fact from the international office in Washington by falsifying dues receipts in order to maintain appearances. Under his absolute control, Irvine handled the locals' funds loosely and without professional bookkeeping. There were conflicting reports as to whether or not its financial records had been lost in a fire in December 1970, on the face of which Irvine reportedly laughed like crazy. Either way, Local 117's accounting books disappeared after Irvine took over. Still, the few records subpoenaed by the Weisberg Commission showed falsified receipts, large unjustified expenses, and occasional money transfers into Irvine's personal account. While this was happening, Irvine and Zanini were teaming up again to organize concrete farming workers into the newly created Plasterers Local 733. Around this time, Irvine also claimed jurisdiction over drywall workers and began vying for Simone's men, including the employees of Del Zotto Enterprises. The sons of an Italian bricklayer who immigrated to Canada in 1927, Angelo, Elvio, and Leo Del Zotto owned one of the largest development corporations in Canada, which would later become Tridel. The three brothers operated more than 90 companies in various sectors, with major holdings in Canada, the US, and the Bahamas. Unlike most builders, the Del Zottos did much of their own construction through various contracting firms that they owned. When it came to lathing and drywall, the Del Zottos worked exclusively with one subcontractor, Cecilio Romanelli. Romanelli immigrated to Canada from Italy in 1954 at the age of 21. After working as a bricklayer, he learned the lathing trade and opened his own subcontracting business in 1957. By the 1970s, he owned a group of construction companies and a cattle farm near Bradford, Ontario, together with Del Zottos, who also owned shares in his lathing and drywall firms. Another partner in one of Romanelli's companies was Frank Fiore, who was offered that opportunity while still a business agent for the Lathers Local 562. Against the recommendation of Romanelli's lawyer, Alvio Del Zotto, he also offered Simone shares in one of his companies as a means to buy labor peace and a steady supply of quality workers. But the union boss refused. Given his close relationship with the local 562 boss, Romanelli feared that Irvine's move into the drywall field would result in his company being pushed out. At this point, both Romanelli and Simone began fearing for their personal safety. Two years earlier, the fiery Scotsman had made a threat on Simone's life as a warning against him attending a meeting with the Laborers International in Chicago, where the Lathers Union agreed to transfer the concrete workers that Simone and Zanini had organized, a betrayal in the eyes of Irvine. Simone's anxiety peaked in the spring of 1971. By his account, one late night in March, he and Romanelli were driving to the latter's cattle farm when a car carrying four men drove out of a side road and blocked their path for about five minutes. Simone later told Judge Weisberg that Romanelli made a telephone call from inside his vehicle, after which the suspicious car drove away. According to Simone, Romanelli then arranged a meeting with him and Angelo Del Zotto at a restaurant in North York, where they communicated their fear of Irvine to the developer. In response, Angelo allegedly gave Romanelli an address and instructed him to go see an unnamed old Italian man the next day. Questioned by Weisberg, both Romanelli and Angelo denied having had that meeting, but the judge was convinced otherwise. In Weisberg's estimation, Romanelli did as instructed and met with the mysterious man, after which he allegedly told Simone that everything was going to be all right. Weisberg concluded that it was after this meeting that a sinister array of characters was introduced to this sector of the industry. According to Irvine, that same month, Paul Volpe visited him in his office, 
purporting to be a labor consultant working for Simone. The mobster offered to mend his relationship with the Lathers' union boss, which Irvine aggressively declined. With Zanini by his side, Irvine informed the media about this alleged visit and presented it as proof of Simone's ties with the Mafia at a public meeting on April 4th, which was attended by one of Zanini's detractors, Morton Schulman. In May, Romanelli hired as his bodyguard Natale Lupino, a convicted criminal from Hamilton and a close associate of Volpe. On Romanelli's recommendation, Simone also hired his own bodyguard, Joe Bagnato, a former lightweight boxing champion and lifelong friend of Volpe, whom he had coached as a child. About six months later, Joe's brother George Bagnato was also hired by Romanelli to pressure a Cadillac development executive into giving him a laughing job worth a quarter of a million dollars. But George's strategy of name-dropping politicians that he supposedly knew went nowhere, much to Volpe's disappointment, to whom Bagnato reported regularly. Another sinister associate of Romanelli was Joseph Zappia, a friend of Lupino hired in Ottawa. The two men escorted Romanelli to a meeting with Jean-Guy Denis, a business agent with a plasterer's local in Ottawa. The drywall subcontractor asked Denis to allow peace workers in a Del Zotto housing project in that city and tried to bribe him with company shares. When the business agent refused, Lupino threatened to run him over. The threats continued for months with the tacit consent of Simone and Alathra's international representative, leading up to a home invasion in January 1973, where Denis's 16-year-old son was knocked unconscious by two unknown men. In June 1971, six of the largest drywall contractors in Metro Toronto met again at the Conroy Hotel and agreed to pay $1,000 a month to Simone to provide them with workers who were to be pulled away from smaller contractors. As he had previously done for the Lathing Combine, Romanelli was the person in charge of collecting up to $15,000 in payments for Simone. However, the local 562 boss claimed that he never received the money by then, Volpe and Lupino had become regular presences at Romanelli's company offices and cattle farm. Romanelli, who had previously worked exclusively for the Del Zottos, asked Volpe to help him find jobs with other builders. While their efforts were unsuccessful, Romanelli's attempts at underbidding his competitors depressed the prices of the drywall combine and made the field unstable. Volpe's influence over the drywall subcontractor was consummated after he convinced him to drop his previous lawyer, Elvio Del Zotto, and hire Volpe's personal attorney. The mobster also convinced Romanelli to incorporate two new companies through his new lawyer, including an investment firm of which Volpe and Natale Lupino's brother were the principals. In the spring of 1972, the five biggest lathing and drywall contractors met again at the Holiday Inn on Dufferin Street to discuss the creation of yet another price-fixing combine. But this attempt at stabilizing the field failed. That summer, Metro Toronto's construction industry saw a resurgence of violence, once again drawing the attention of the public and their politicians to what seemed by now a perennially troublesome industry. On July 1, 1972, Canada Day, the company office of Acme Lathing and Drywall Limited was hit by 28 machine gun shots. This attack was followed by three bomb explosions in July and September, two of them targeting Acme, and one targeting the laughing subcontractor, Gemini. There's a lot of money involved. Uh, there's an extreme lot of money involved. Uh, in our particular industry, uh, we've assessed uh, laughing, drywall, plastering in the, just the Toronto area. Uh, residential alone is 50 million. It's a large industry. Toronto's done a lot of building. There's a billion dollars in construction done annually here. It's the hottest uh, place in North America. As the subsequent investigation revealed in the spring of 1972, Acme was preparing to merge with two other subcontracting firms, Downsview and Gemini, after similar talks with Romanelli's company had failed. But just before this merger was to be consolidated, Downsview withdrew after one of its owners was threatened with violence. Other subcontractors in the price-fixing combine were further upset after Acme bid and won three contracts. According to Acme's owner, Naftali Kanner, Simone met with him over lunch and engaged in what he called double talk, where the union boss made veiled threats on his family in an effort to convince him to withdraw one of his bids. 
Kenner refused to back out, and his company began experiencing trouble, including not receiving enough workers to finish its building projects. After the attacks, the merger between Acme and Gemini was called off. Judge Weisberg later inferred from the mounting evidence presented at the Royal Commission that one of the men who carried out the attacks was the biker Charles Yanover, who had received assistance from other suspects connected with Volpe. Given the mobster's association with Romanelli, Weisberg suggested that the subcontractor was likely behind the attacks on Acme and Gemini. As the police continued to probe the escalating violence, Bruno Zanini carried out his own investigation into the infiltration of crime syndicates in Toronto's and Hamilton's residential construction industry. For this, he counted on the support of the former Labour reporter Frank Drea, who is now a progressive conservative member of provincial parliament. The two of them planned to gather evidence of Labour racketeering and give it to the Attorney General. Depressed, unemployed and impoverished, Zanini had also been trying to clear his mafioso reputation, which had forced him out of the labor movement and brought him hardship. Then, in February 1972, Zanini had a candid conversation with John Dalimonte, the former vice president of his independent concrete farming union, who confessed to have been threatened and bribed by Simone into betraying Zanini and joining the rival Concrete Farming Council. Delamonte also revealed that he had been instructed by a lawyer to sign one of the affidavits on which Shulman had based his damning statements at Queen's Park two years earlier, where he accused Zanini of being connected with the head of Hamilton's mafia, Johnny Papalia. Morton Shulman, who was an MPP, was speaking in the legislature where whatever he says he's immune from libel, saying that he believes that there is a phony Canadian union being run by the mob. Shulman refused to say this outside the legislature for obviously very good reasons. It was later found out, if this is true, that Shulman got this information about it being a phony union from an affidavit that was uh, sworn by De Lorenzo's investigator, Menzies and Di Lorenzo's foreman, John Delamonte. John Delamonte may says he did sign it, but as Zanini has said, maybe he couldn't read English, maybe he did not understand. And D John Delamonte, according to Zanini, later confessed. He said, yes, that's what happened. So the allegations were basically sworn statements by these two men. Delamonte, who had left the Forming Council in 1970 after a dispute with the Labourers Local 183, convinced Zanini to look into that union's alleged preferential treatment of some employers at the expense of the workers, who were supposedly cheated of their overtime hours and benefits. Feeling vindicated by all of this, Zanini announced a public meeting in September 1972 where Delamonte was to share his story with the world. His hope was to convince Premier Bill Davis to launch another royal commission into the murky financing of Toronto's residential construction industry and its exploitative practices from the top down. But on August 23rd, less than two weeks before this meeting was to take place, Zanini was shot in the leg by two unknown men in the underground parking garage of his social housing apartment building in Weston. After crawling 30 feet, the 51-year-old former union organizer was found bleeding on the floor by his two teenage sons, who sprinted to his aid after one of the assailants called their unlisted number and told them that their father had been shot. When interviewed at his bedside at the Humber Memorial Hospital, Zanini speculated that this had been the work of paid professionals, hired by the builders who wanted to prevent another government inquiry and make him stop probing the apartment building industry. It was at this point that Zanini's collaboration with Drea became public, along with a repeated suggestion that the Mafia had infiltrated the industry, which drew criticism from the Building Trades Council that accused them of smearing the international unions. Shulman, in turn, scoffed at the notion that Zanini was working to expose organized crime and argued instead that the shooting was just another episode in an ongoing battle for control over the Italian construction workforce in the city. 
Well, this series of violence has now been going on since 1968. There have been hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of damage done at construction sites. We've now had submachine gunnings, bombings, and the police uh, have been unable to lay any charges. They, they did lay one charge several years ago, which didn't stick, was thrown out of court. Uh, the bombers, uh, although the police believe they know who they are, are still at large, and uh, they're lying low now because of all the publicity, but unquestionably, sometime in 1973, they'll be active again. We'll be right back in the same mess we were in the first place. And the only way to get them, if that's what we want to do, is to have a royal commission, put them in the stand, ask them specific questions, and there is tape record evidence in which you can now get them on perjury, if nothing else. On December 5th, 1972, Shulman again stood at the Ontario Legislature and gave a two-hour speech making his case for a Royal Commission inquiry into the construction industry. This time, he accused the Attorney General, Dalton Bales, of being at a party with Anthony Cesaroni, a drywall subcontractor, whom Shulman accused of being behind the attacks on Acme Company, together with Romanelli. According to the member of provincial parliament, Simone, Romanelli, and Cesaroni were not worried about being investigated, since they thought they had a powerful friend in the front row of cabinet. Many of Shulman's remarks about the unlawful practices in the lathing and drywall fields were later confirmed by the Waysburg Commission. However, the private investigator on whose report Shulman had based some of his accusations denied ever seeing the Attorney General at this party. Unable to substantiate his claims on this matter, Shulman was strongly rebuked by both the Conservatives and the Liberals, who called for his resignation, which he refused. Shulman eventually withdrew his comments about Bales, but the Attorney General's code of ethics had been irrevocably compromised earlier that year, when he and other prominent members of cabinet were found to be in conflict of interest over land that they had purchased while their government was in the midst of discussing plans to develop it. Premier Davis addressed this by introducing new conflict of interest guidelines and instructing his ministers to disclose their land holdings. This might explain why the Progressive Conservative government was reluctant to launch an in-depth investigation into Metro Toronto's building industry. Still, the pressure mounted on Queen's Park to do something about the violence and seeming lawlessness in that much maligned industry. Finally, on March 28, 1973, Premier Davis appointed Judge Harry Weisberg to lead the Royal Commission on certain sectors of the building industry which was to focus only on the infiltration of crime syndicates and the violence in the tile and terrazzo, drywall, and concrete forming fields over the previous five years. For seven months, the inquiry heard from about 200 witnesses, including investigators, union leaders, contractors, and their alleged criminal associates. The developers were left alone, except for the Del Zottos, who denied having previous knowledge of Romanelli's involvement with Volpe and his associates, and claimed to have severed ties with their subcontractor once they heard rumors of his involvement in the attacks on Acme. The commission's star witness was Gus Simone, who agreed to testify about the industry's unlawful practices, including his own, under the protection of the Canada Evidence Act, which meant that his testimony could not later be used against him in court. Less fortunate were Natalie Lupino and Joseph Zappia, who were convicted of perjury for their testimony at the inquiry where they fabricated a story about a check from Romanelli, who was also on trial, but was acquitted. Judge Weisberg said, definitely, organized crime has been involved in the construction industry. There was very little hard evidence, but he did affirm it. He said that Zanini did not shoot himself, as some people thought he had, Zanini felt that this was far too narrow an inquiry. Industry is very complex, it's murky, unions moving other unions around, mob money here and there, and he was very disappointed with the outcome because it was not the full story. Just before the inquiry, uh, somebody confronted him in the King Edward Hotel, I believe, and said, you know, would you be interested in organizing the barbers? Well, I guess Zanini would be interested in organizing whatever. And, and he said, well, let me, you know, he talked to me about it. And they said, uh, well, why don't you just come and we'll take you for a ride in the car? And he said, well, oh, 
So Zanini said, okay. So it was somebody sitting in the front seat. So he had sort of a flat face, said Bruno. And he got in the back with the other fellow. And the guy in the front said, oh, Zanini, you were the guy that got shot in the leg, eh? And uh, Zanini thought to himself, oh, dear. He said, why don't, why, don't you just, why don't we just go to a restaurant and have some coffee? Wouldn't that be better? And they, say, they wanted to drive around in circles. So Zanini said uh, to himself, I don't think this is a very good thing. And they said, they let him out again, King Edward. And they said, just watch yourself. But Zanini did not bring this up or this threat in front of um, when the inquiry was going on. But it certainly was in the back of his mind. The Royal Commission's two-volume report, published in December 1974, included 13,000 pages of transcribed evidence and public hearings. Even before the massive report was published, the proceedings had generated a great deal of news coverage, which exposed the messy, unlawful, and sometimes violent nature of labor management relations in some fields of the construction industry. But the inquiry failed to produce any major criminal convictions or address the larger systemic problems at the source of its lawlessness. Nonetheless, Weisberg made a series of legislative recommendations, some of which were later implemented. The commission really was a blessing in disguise. We were the first one to be investigated. They came in, they took all our records, they interviewed all our representatives, but we came out completely clean. There was no one single allegation of any wrongdoing. I called our lawyer and asked him to present a brief containing a number of recommendations to change the legislation. The most important one was the settlement of the grievances. Why? You have a problem on the job. Somebody gets fired, or other things like that. What was the procedure? You had to apply for, uh, send the, the grievance, and if you don't settle, you go to arbitration, which is very lengthy, could take one, two, or three years, very expensive, and by the time you, you conclude it, the job is well finished. So I thought it was important to have a procedure that would uh, make a quick decision. And I came up with the idea the Labor Board should do that. Judge Weinsberg was very sympathetic to our proposal, especially the one on the settlement of the grievance procedure, because he was, a pri he was an arbitrator himself in Sudbury and knew the length and the, and the cost to settle the grievance. Now, what a surprise that the government of Ontario adopted this recommendation that actually were my recommendation. And there was a major, major change in the Ontario Labor Relations Act that still now is extended not just to the construction workers, to the everybody. This brought a lot of peace in the industry. If Irvine had a provision in 1960, those unions were still around. After climbing to the top of the Plasterers International Union in Canada, with only a grade four education, the once feared Scotsman retired from the labor movement in 1976, with only one of his locals still in operation. He spent the last years of his life helping at his son's record store and enjoying his passion for fishing before he died in 1981 at age 74. It had been quite a journey for Charles Irvine and Bruno Zanini. The Friulani immigrant outlived his towering partner by three more decades, during which he became a house builder himself. Zanini had started out as a petty criminal in the depressed streets of Toronto's West End, where working-class Italian, Jewish, and other so-called foreign kids learned to stand up and demand respect from their British bullies with toughness. His opera dreams played out differently than what he'd imagined. 
Still, his tenor voice and onstage charisma found the adulation of large crowds of Italian working men, whose own dreams of a better life in Canada, he gave license to soar. But Zanini's real-life opera came with tragic consequences and moral ambiguity, where the heroes and the villains of his story were often one and the same. Zanini sort of provided a thread of the story, and he was quite fearless at times. At times he could be evasive, but he, he, and then you never know if, if, if people would threaten him a little bit, and he said, well, you know, how long is it going to take? Is it going to take forever for this book to come out? And I said, well, I, I, I'm listening to you, but I also have to do my own research. And so at, at one point, he said, you know, I, I, I don't think I can go along with this anymore. And I said, have you been threatened or are you, are you, he just, he didn't answer to that. But he said, I think, I think I want to quit it. And I said, well, if, if that's your decision, that's fine. I will continue because I feel the story should be told. I did not ever hear back from Zanini once the book came out. I believe he had two sons. And he had a wife uh, who had mul multiple sclerosis. So it was a lot that he had to deal with. After the inquiry, I think he worked with his son. He did some construction, then maybe some real estate. Uh, but that I only found that out when I saw his obituary in, in the newspaper. Bruno Zanini died in 2009 at the age of 87, heart failure. Unlike Zanini, who had little wealth to show for after he left the labor movement, Gus Simoni built a large house in a rural township one hour north of Toronto, which he was only able to afford because of the many gifts of labor and materials that he received from contractors. There, he became a neighbor and regular visitor to Paul Volpe's mansion in nearby Schomburg. In 1976, Simone was convicted of tax evasion for the over $40,000 in payoffs and building materials that he had received from contractors. Despite the scandals, Simone remained an active union organizer in Metro Toronto with the United Brotherhood of Carpenters after it assimilated his former Lathers Local 562 in 1980. And he would play a major role in their controversial battle with the Laborers Local 183 over the organization of house framers in the early 80s. Cecilio Romanelli was back in the news in December 1981 after he dumped the carcasses of three dead cattle at the front door of a bank branch in Toronto as a way of protesting its refusal to lend him money to buy feed, which resulted in the loss of 24 heads of cattle. According to the bank, Romanelli was more than $1 million in debt the Ontario Humane Society later seized Romanelli's surviving cattle stock after a tense confrontation outside his barricaded farm. After this, the disgraced former contractor was appointed to the role of representative of the Carpenters International Union on Simone's recommendation. But only three weeks later, in January 1983, Romanelli died of encephalitis at age 49. Later that year, Romanelli's former associate and by then, Simone's close friend, Paul Volpe, was found dead in the trunk of his wife's car in the Toronto International Airport's parking garage. One of the last persons to see him alive was his driver, Peter Scarcella, who earlier that year had replaced Romanelli as the Carpenters' Union representative, appointed, once again, on Simone's recommendation as a supposed favor to Volpe. Scarcella would later become a known associate of the Rizzuto crime family in Montreal, after the collapse of the Magadino's influence in Toronto. Once considered one of the most powerful crime syndicates in the U.S., Buffalo's Magadino crime family had been crumbling since the late 60s. Still, they managed to keep control of the laborers' local 210 until 1996, when the International Union's office ousted its leadership and expelled those members tied to organized crime after a long FBI investigation. The U.S. government then took over the Buffalo Laborers Local and appointed a retired investigator as its business manager, whose task was to clean it up of criminal elements. Having done so, Local 210 was returned to its membership in 2006. One of the major assets in this FBI investigation was Ronald Fino, 
a local 210 leader and son of the former mob boss, Josefino, who had become an FBI informant in the mid-70s. According to Ron Fino, in 1987, American mafia chieftains debated whether or not to assassinate the leader of the laborers' local 183, John Stefanini, and procured a contract killer for the job, who came very close to fulfilling it. Fino was convinced that Stefanini had no ties with the criminal underworld. But this was of little consolation to Stefanini when he was beaten by a group of men outside of his office in 1999, two years after he had retired from Local 183 and become the executive director of an organization dedicated to ending the practice of membership rating by rival construction unions. The unions are know they are fairly clean they make a number of mistakes from time to time, uh, but at least the Canadian unions that the one I know, they are, in my opinion, a good example of good, clean, law-abiding unions. Those allegation unions were really a number of years ago, in the 60s and the 70s. I don't think there was any allegation in the last 20, 30 years of organized crime. Tiny communities the most law-abiding community of anybody, according to statistic. And yet, one Italian has a nice house, drive around with a nice car, or is a mafia member. They understand that is the product of hard work and creativity. The Royal Commission's report confirmed the fears of Torontonians about the mafia's presence in their city. It also vindicated Shulman, who had first raised these fears at Queen's Park. The rogue new Democratic member of provincial parliament agreed with Judge Weisberg's conclusion in December 1974 that the construction industry was by then free from crime syndicates since their operations had been exposed out of existence by the inquiry. Justified or not, perceptions of organized crime's presence in the city's real estate and building sectors persist in the minds of Torontonians. Informed by the occasional news of money laundering in the overinflated housing market, of union leaders being brazenly beaten, and other murky stories that are interpreted against our collective memory of the great heights and great lows of Toronto's construction industry. <laughs> <laughs>